Hello, thank you for joining me. My name is Pam Callan, and I'm here representing the North End Gallery Learn and Share program. I'm sure you've seen some other wonderful artists working. I'm going to teach you captivating pastel landscapes. At least that's my intention. I have to share with you that I don't have an advanced degree in art. In fact, I don't have a degree in art at all. My degrees are in completely different things. But I have always loved art, and I have studied for the past 20 years or so with a number of good artists and good teachers. And if you're lucky, you can get both in one individual. I found that doesn't always happen, but enough. I've studied with enough different people, and that's what you should do too. You should. I encourage you to study with as many different art teachers as you can find in as many different settings and in as many different mediums. So thank you for joining me and we're going to get started on captivating pastel landscapes. And I'll share whatever I know with you, which may not be as much as some of you know already, but for what it's worth, we're going to get started. We're going to talk now about the advantages and disadvantages of pastels. I normally work in oil paints, but for purposes of this series that North End Gallery has, um, has initiated, we're going, to, um, we're going to work in pastels today because we have other people covering watercolors and oils. Pastels do have certain advantages. They are easy to transport. This is an example of an entire box of pastels. If you compare this with the oil paints, the solvents, the brushes, all of those kinds of things that you have to cart around as an oil painter, not to mention a huge easel, and paper towels and all these things, um, it's, it's just much easier. You can work upright, and you should work upright, and I'll talk about why here in a second um, when we get to the disadvantages, but ease of transport. They dry, they're dry when they go on, so you, you're not gonna have to wait for the watercolor to dry or the oil to dry or the acrylic to dry or worrying about bugs flying into it or anything else because nothing's going to stick um, except hopefully your pastel to the paper. I have another set of pastels here. I've got soft pastels, hard pastels, pastel pencils, and all of that. We'll get to that in a second when we talk about supplies. But the advantages and disadvantages. Okay, easy to transport. Beautiful coverage. They tend to stick, particularly to the surfaces we're going to talk about today, and the ones I'm going to recommend. You have the ability to change and edit your work as you go. Of course you can do that in oils, and of course you can do it in acrylics. Not so much in watercolors, although there are certain things you can get away with even there. Now it's not indefinite, and we'll talk about that. And it's, as I said, it's dry when you put it on, so you don't have to wait. Whatever you do, if it starts raining or and you're outside, you just cover it and you go because there's no, nothing's going to, to be ruined because it's wet. Let's talk about the disadvantages a little bit. They're dusty. They're very dusty. And to some extent, they're toxic. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how to use them safely as we go along. You, you should take precautions. One of the, the teachers I most admire talks about the fact that we should have a mask on even when during non-COVID times because they're so very toxic, you don't wanna be breathing them in. But we're gonna talk about how to avoid breathing them in, just letting the dust fall. The final work will have to be protected more than some of the other mediums you may be using. 
you will have to close up the back. You will, it, you will have to, if you really want to preserve the work, space the front between the mat and the work so that the dust, because it continues to, to be dusty forever, falls down, the chalky rather, uh, between the mat and the work. I don't always follow that rule and I've had very few problems and I don't fix the final product either. I don't fix because it changes the color, I believe. And here's the, here's the real issue that some of us ran into on in a recent trip to, to a foreign country to do pastels and take a pastel class. The pastels may look like bullets to airport TSA agents. And so I suggest you carry them in your carry-on. It's safest to do that anyway because if you have to replace them, it could be, I don't know, a couple hundred dollars minimum. So have them easy to get to. They're easy to transport. I do have a sort of a heavy box that I'm carrying them in just because I can, because I'm here at home. But if I were going to travel, believe me, these would be in cardboard protected in some way. So those are the advantages and disadvantages that I can think of um, right off the bat with regard to using pastels to paint. With regard to supplies, what we're going to talk about first is how to plan and lay out a composition. And so there are certain tools you're going to need in order to do that. An easel, like this one, or not like this one, anyone will do, and a drawing board. Because what you're going to want to do is take your support, we call these things supports, the, the papers and so forth, and attach them so that they, they are static and don't move around while you're trying to work on them. Thumbnail paper. Thumbnail paper you can use, and I often do, if, especially if I'm traveling, a sketchbook. Tear out a page or, or do your thumbnail in here and go ahead and do that. This is actually 300 pound watercolor paper, which you can tell there's an old watercolor on it. It didn't turn out very well, and so that's why that's being used on this side. Or just small cards. And what we're going to do with those things, uh, we'll talk about in a second. Reference photos. Here are a couple of mine. This is actually my daughter's backyard and it probably inspired the small pastel that's over there. And here's another one. I know this might be the woods at Williamsburg, somewhere like that. Anyway, I just like the lights and darks that we're here and we're talk about how much detail to include or exclude as we go along. I haven't selected which one of these we're going to do today, but I do want to select one of them to do. Maybe I'll select this one since it's um, one I haven't worked on before. And then we'll all experiment together. So the reference photos should either be yours or if you're going to use someone else's photos, you must have their permission. There are copyright issues. So we have to be careful as artists. And for Lord's sake, don't use somebody else's artwork as a reference. If you're going to sell the work, or display it as your own. Um, you can use a viewfinder. I don't often do that. We're going to talk about the rule of thirds. We're going to talk about focal points. We're going to talk about all of that. So unless I'm outside and I've got the whole world in front of me, I don't worry about a viewfinder to help me narrow the scope. I find using a, a photograph, or even if I'm outside, I can do that just mentally. A pencil, a kneaded eraser, and a stump. And that is to prepare. These are all the tools that you're going to use to prepare, plan your layout and composition because these things don't just happen. You have to think about them. And if you do that, then you can relax and enjoy the process a lot more, I have found. I've tried to do it both ways, and it works much better if you think about how you want it to look when you're completed. It doesn't always work out the way that you hope it will, but maybe something akin to what you hope it will look like is what you wind up with. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the pastels themselves, the supplies for painting the pastels. This is Canson Mitton. This is the expensive version. It has 
tooth on one side, very subtle tooth, and that's to grab the pastels. It's pretty smooth on the other side. That's the expensive version. This is another version, Canson Miton Pastel, and it comes in different colors. And the advantage there is you don't have to, uh, you can use the background as your middle value or something like that. For example, this one, I can see adding lights and darks and you'd come up with something nice. It does have a little bit of a tooth. My preferred, <laughs> maybe I'm lazy, but my preferred paper is the premium sanded pastel paper by UART. Um, it, it is actually a type of sandpaper. It's got all kinds of teeth in it. And the advantage to that is that you don't have to work nearly as hard to get that pastel to adhere and you can go over it many more times because the, this, the power of pastel is in the layers that you have on the paper. This is, what is this? This is 400 grade. There are different grades. This one is a trial pack. It had seven different sheets and seven different grades and we were I was tinkering around with that. I prefer the 400 to 600. It goes as low as I think 100 and goes up to 800 or something. But I prefer the middle range 4 to 600. My very favorite is this one. It's a 400 grade and built right into the packaging is plasticine that helps you protect the work once it's completed. We're going to talk about that a little bit at the end so that you know how to protect your work as you're going to transport it. And then there are the usual things. There's, uh, you've got your paper. You're ready to go with your paper. Then there is charcoal. Medium or, or uh, soft charcoal will work just fine. This is the one that I'm going to use today. It's it's got a nice little thing to hold it so you don't have to get your hand all dirty if that bothers you. At some point when you're using pastels, you're going to get pretty dirty anyway, i got to tell you. Um, fixative. I tend to fix the charcoal layer. The charcoal layer is the one that goes on as a value study. So we'll talk about values now. We, we, why don't we do that? Well, this is a value finder. What is powerful about a composition, let's talk a little bit about composition, <clears throat> is the darks and lights in it. And we'll, we'll get more into that as we move through this. So we're, we're, we're ready to do our pastel now. We're moving through that. It obviously goes from white to black. For, for landscapes, we're going to stay somewhere in here. We're not going to go on the edges. There are very few real blacks and real whites in nature. They're down in here somewhere. Usually these four to six values right here. Fixative. Talk about the fixative. So once you get the charcoal on there, and you don't want it to move while you're putting the pastel on, you can buy a fixative or a workable fixative, and that's exactly what they're called. I have some. I didn't bring it with me because I have discovered, and one of my teachers recommends, that cheap hairspray works just as well as fix expensive fixative. It's the same basic ingredient, so uh, that's what we're going to use today. A rubber eraser, white pearl is my preference. Let's see if I brought one with me. Here it is. It's not white anymore, but there it is. And what we do with this is, and I might sand that off a little bit, we don't erase with it. We move things around. We maybe create a reflection in pastels, things like that. Um, scissors, ruler, masking tape. The masking tape is just to put your work up here so it doesn't move around. Um, an apron to protect your clothing, which mine is somewhere here. 
So here is my apron. Thank you. <laughs> here is my apron. Um, I'll put that on here in just a moment. An old towel. A fan brush. Like this one. This will be handy as we... Should we want to correct something? With pastels, the secret is assuming you've learned use light touch, which is what we always want to do with pastels. You can just take that fan brush and wipe along whatever it is you want to erase and it falls right down here. And you don't have to worry about it anymore. Then you can start over reworking that section. So that's what that's for. This is to maybe scrub something out if it's a little more tenacious. Um, and then I've got gloves here. I might put them on. We'll see. And I've got wipes somewhere to, to help clean my hands. Um, just any kind of baby wipe will, will do to help keep you clean. Maybe cl keep your, clean up your, your easel. Don't be shaking a lot of dust around. For God's sake, do not breathe in and blow. Because if you breathe in, you're going to breathe in some of those toxins. Don't blow on this. You're going to blow it all over the room. What you want to do is let everything fall down and then knock it into a tr trash can sideways when you're finished. That's the safest thing to do. And then, then we have the handy dandy chamois cloth for or charcoal I find works well, or just a regular old rag. I have an old dish rag in here I can use. I'm going to keep my chamois handy. Um, so that, that, uh, that's it, except, of course, for the pastels. We have our hard pastels, we have our soft pastels, and we're going to work in that order. First comes the charcoal, then comes the hard pastel, then comes the soft pastel, and then come the pencils. You can work back and forth between those things if you want to, if you want a sharp edge when you're all done with something. Just get your hard pastel. There's no law. Nobody's going to come arrest you for using whatever it is you want to use in your work. And you can work back and forth. You may have, particularly if you use the sanded pastel paper, you may have up to 10 layers that you can lay in, in certain areas. So, but you have to keep your touch light. Don't push too hard on that paper because you will flatten the tooth and then you won't have as good a result as you might be looking for. So you can't work back and forth in indefinitely. That's the, the name of the game. A couple more things that might be handy for you are uh, a kneaded eraser the kind that you can just sort of knead, push around, because they absorb an awful lot. And you can work in very tiny areas with them because you can sort of make them into a point. You can do all kinds of things. They work on pencil, they work on charcoal. Obviously, if you're working a lot of charcoal, you don't want to be erasing all the time because this will very soon be black. This is a stump. It's called a stump. Um, it's designed to help you soften edges and create gray areas between the blacks and the whites of the value study. And the value study is the first thing that you're going to do. A no tan is my preference because that really keeps you honest. Uh, no tan is, I believe, a Japanese term, and it actually means no tan. It's got to be light or dark, nothing in between. So the middle tones that you might see in some of this other work around here would not be included in the no tan version that you're going to lay in when you get started. And we'll, I'll demonstrate that for you so you see what that looks like. You, you know, when I first do my my value, my little thumbnail, which, which is the first step in this process. I might put in some grays, but when I actually get out my pastel paper and I stick it up here, 
I'm going to do a no tan in charcoal on that paper and then I'm going to fix it and that's going to be the basis and the advantage there is it keeps you from getting middle tonitis and to have a striking composition you want to make sure that you've got lights and darks in there very light lights and very dark darks somewhere preferably in the focal point and we'll talk a little bit more about that other things to remember when you start laying out your composition. Remember the color gets the credit and I do love pastel colors. Whenever I see them, I'm drawn to them. Wherever I am, if I'm looking at an art show, I see those pastel colors. Boy, it sucks you right in. But what really does the work in a composition is the values. So you want to keep that in mind and that's the, that's the advantage of starting with a no tan. It keeps you honest that way. Odd numbers are more pleasing than easy, e even numbers in composition. For some unknown reason, that's just how it is. Very heights don't have three trees the same height. It's just not very interesting. You're going to have, a, if we're talking about landscapes, so you're going to have a a distance, you're going to have a middle ground, and you're going to have a foreground. And we're going to talk a little bit about each of those as we go along. And then there's the rule of thirds. If you were to take, for example, this paper and divide it up, we'll just do it on here because we don't need all this, all these, or here, I'll do it on here. Um, you're going to have a canvas. Uh, I might do I might do mine in the in the portrait rather than the landscape. Um, so we're going to have the rule of thirds, and what we want to do is one of these four areas should serve as our focal point in our composition. That's really all we're talking about here, and that's not hard and fast, okay? But that's a good thing to remember. Um, so that's it as far as laying out the composition and things to remember. I crib a lot from John F. Carlson's book, Carlson's Guide to Landscape Painting. Every good art teacher I have had who does good landscapes, that is the book that they recommend. It's been around forever. And... So I recommend it. If you're going to have one book about landscapes, that's the one. He talks about the mistakes you can make. He talks about how to avoid them. This is the theory of his keeping the whites out and the blacks out. And then the distance is, is the lightest part of the, the, the composition normally is the sky. Although not always. When I'm sometimes looking at the bay, the bay is lighter than the sky because of the light, the way that it shines. So none of this is hard and fast, but normally sky is the lightest. Then you go to the ground, which is under the sky. Okay, and that's very light. And that's the foreground. The middle ground, which is, uh, the, sorry, the distance is the third lightest. So you've got the sky first. The land that it's shining on, second. The distance, third. And then the uprights are, tend to be the darkest. So we're going to go along with that. We're going we're to follow that, those rules. Um, there are a bunch of different ways you can put a painting together, and some of them are just striking and beautiful without following that particular rule. But that's the way we're going to try to do things today.